Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This all happened about a week before my son's seventh birthday. I'm a 38-year-old male, and I hadn't got him, him a gift yet. So after work, I ask his mother to pick him up from school as I drive myself to Walmart to browse the toy section for something that he would possibly want. While trying to decide between a Nerf gun or an Iron Man action figure, I heard a woman's voice behind me. Ah, browsing for yourself or a little one? I turned around to see a woman around my age in an employee vest with a smile, clearly amused by her own joke. Well, clearly it's for me, but on an unrelated note, any ideas for a birthday gift for a seven-year-old boy? I retort. The woman chuckled a bit before pointing out that the Nerf gun. <laughs> this, this one, this one sells really well. And taking her word for it, I put the gun in my cart before thanking her and then pushing off. However, she stops me and says, is there anything else I can do to help you today? She said, stepping into my line of sight again. No, no thank you, I say. I really just came for the toy, but thank you again. And with that, I pushed my cart past her. As I made my way to the checkout, I saw a good deal on cherries and decided to swing over to the groceries to see what else I might want to get while I was there. A few minutes later, as I was knocking on some watermelons, I heard the same voice from before. I thought you were only here for the Nerf gun. I turn around to see the woman again. Um, yeah, but I decided to do some grocery shopping while I was here. I know, I know. I didn't have to explain myself to her, but in order to be polite... I decided to reply to her small talk, but I just kept this short because I was getting a weird feeling about this lady. She continued to follow me around during my shopping, which I had decided to cut short given the situation. I then went to self-checkout since the line was shorter there. Usually, I don't mind waiting in line for a cashier, but today, I wanted to be done a lot sooner than normal. I scanned my items and I swiped my points card before paying and I then left. The woman was standing at the exit doors, literally watching me as I left. I thought that this was the end of it, until later that afternoon, I got a phone call. Hello? I answered, only to be greeted by the same cheery voice that I heard at the Walmart. Hello, is this? She said my name. I was shocked. How did you get my number? I asked. Well, I usually don't do this, but I really like talking to you, so after I saw you had a membership card, I looked it up and I found your phone number in our database. She said, sounding almost proud of herself. What the hell? What is wrong with you? Isn't that illegal? I was outraged. This was an invasion of my personal information. Oh, come on. It's not that big of a deal. Like I said, I just really like talking to you. And now that I've called, you can save my number, okay? Flabbergasted by her nonchalantness over the situation, I blurted out, No, not at all. I'm married, and I don't want anything to do with you. This is not okay. The phone line went silent for a long time before she hung up. She never called again, nor did I see her ever again at the Walmart, but I did report her, so that may be the reason why. But still, I hope that I never see that over-friendly Walmart employee again. I was at a large outdoor mall in Columbus, Ohio and I wanted to do a little shopping before going into work nearby at 2 p.m. So, keep in mind 
that this happened on a Wednesday afternoon in May. I parked on the first floor of a garage, a row directly across from the main entrance of the indoor mall area towards the back. As soon as I parked, I made eye contact with a guy walking in the next row. I was a 26 female at that time, and this guy looked to be around my age, if not younger. He turned towards me and then started walking my way. I put my head down, started gathering my things, and the next thing I knew, he was knocking on my window. I can't remember if I've already had the window down or if I rolled it down more, but anyways, the window was almost halfway down. He asked me where the closest restroom was. I told him that there is one as soon as you walk in the main entrance of the mall. He said that he didn't know where that was and if I would show him there. I pointed and I said that you literally just need to walk down this row and then go through the doors and the signs will be right there. But he really wanted me to show him where it was. He just stood there and looked at me for what felt like forever after he realized that I wasn't going to get out and show him the restroom. He then asked me if he could hop in the back seat real quick, and that's when my confusion went to panic. I really started to panic. I don't even remember if I responded to that right off the bat. He just kept going on, asking if he could get in, and then asked to hook up in the back seat. I just said no thank you, and that I have a boyfriend, and I'm sorry? To which he responded, It's okay. I have a girlfriend and I love her. This just kept going on, me telling him that I needed to go and get to work and that I was sorry. He kept texting or something with his phone during the conversation too. I was afraid that he would try to open my door and I didn't want to lock them and somehow trigger this guy into doing something else. Somehow, I finally got the courage to start the car back up, reverse the car, and got the absolute fuck out of there before he could say anything else. I worked a couple blocks away and I hurried into the building before I called security. I have no idea what this guy's intentions actually were. I truly felt that he was trying to get me out of the car and possibly had other people close by. Maybe he really did just want to hook up, but who in the right mind goes about it in that kind of way? Was he bait for human trafficking? Was he just trying to rob me? He seemed to be a normal person until the interaction furthered. Thankfully, I was in a rental car because mine had been stolen exactly three weeks prior to this happening. I'm just very happy that this guy did not see what I typically drove if he happened to snag the license plate and the make and model of the car. What do you think this was? Does anybody here have any similar experiences? I still think about this to this day, and it's been about two years now. Transportation in the Philippines were made easier because there are motorcycle taxis here, and they are much cheaper compared to your Uber or Grab cars. You just need to book a rider through an app, just like how you would book Uber in your country. I'm used to taking them whenever it's not raining, and it's a faster way to get to my workplace, but that's just the tip of the iceberg to my story. One particular night, I was craving for something to eat. It was around 1 a.m. It took me an hour or two of scrolling through my phone to look for food to satisfy my cravings when I just decided that I'd go to 7-Eleven, which is just a few blocks away from the village that I live in. I decided to just walk there because the evening breeze was nice. I reached the highway and I walked to the nearest pedestrian lane. The streets were a bit dim, when suddenly, a man on the motorcycle stopped by me, and he was urging me to ride on his motorcycle. Motorcycle taxis here have uniforms, so I know that he was a phony. 
7-Eleven was still two blocks away, so I just politely brushed him off and said that I wanted to walk. He then took off, and I felt a rush of relief. I enjoyed the rest of my walk. When I came to this block where only one street lamp was working and the light from it was not a big help at all. My heart started beating fast and I was sweating. Mind you, it was cold during that time. Something is stopping me from taking a step further. My legs felt heavy, but I did my best to walk because I was really hungry during that time. I don't have the perfect vision and I can't see anything that is more than four feet away from me. When I was about to reach the corner where the only working street lamp is standing, I see the guy from earlier. And he was smoking something. I squinted my eyes, and he was smoking crack. I walked faster until I reached 7-Eleven. I shopped for my food, and when I went to the cashier to pay for my stuff, there were three people ahead of me. I then see the guy again, he went behind me, and he was holding a roll of aluminum foil. I was shaking, and I was about to cry when suddenly, my childhood friend who is a police officer came in, and he greeted me. I greeted him back, and my friend then offered me a ride because he just clocked out and told me to wait for him. He went to the drink section of the store, when the guy whispered something in my ear. <laughs> Suerte mo, miss. Di ka marirape na yon. Which translates to, Miss, you're lucky. I can't rape you now. When I was 15, I went to a show in Liverpool, UK with a friend. My friend told me that he was staying at a friend's house, so I boarded the 25-minute train home alone. This was the last train home at around 11.30 p.m. I found a seat and I stared out of the window as the city lights faded into peripheral twinkles. So, five minutes in, my trance was broken by the soft croak of an older guy, maybe 50, with a dusty blonde hair and aviator-framed glasses. Hello, young man. Are you okay? You look lonely. Shocked and confused, I nodded and said, Oh, I'm okay, thanks. The name's Dean. Do you like smoking weed or drinking beers? I've got some at my house. Are you stopping at crew? You could pop in, you know, he said. N -n no, I I'm getting off at Runcorn. I mistakenly replied, cringing internally. I excused myself to use the bathroom as I made my way hastily across the carriage. The twinkling city lights now replaced by dank fields and a semi-urban decay. I peeked back, noticing the man playing with what seemed to be a needle. I sped up to the bathroom and I locked the door. It was only ten more minutes until my stop. The next stop is Runcorn. I don't think a digitized train announcement has ever sounded so heavenly. I threw the door open and I bolted to the exit, but as my feet touched the station floor, I felt a firm grip on my shoulder. Looking back in fear and trying to shake off the grip, I acted fast and instinctively. I shouted, Dad! at a completely empty and on the other side of the gate. The now stumbling backwards Dean let out a oh fuck under his breath and ran to the other side of the train while I ran through the gate. I sprinted all the way home and told my parents who told the police. But we never heard anything. To start with, I'm a 27-year-old female and I'm a reporter for a small-time local news channel. The work I do mostly pertains to writing scripts and asking questions and later saying them on camera, 
sometimes interviewing passers-by to get public opinion. The day started just like any other day. The city was tearing down a lot of smaller hospitals in the area and creating one large one in the center of town, which had mixed feelings in the public eye. I was in the downtown area with my camera crew asking people about their opinions on the matter. Many people were against it because it meant a farther drive from their homes, but having a newer hospital is never a bad thing either. Most people tended to say either or. However, that changed when I interviewed one man. Looking about mid-30s with a red baseball cap and a denim jacket on, if he hadn't been interested in talking, I would have simply ignored him. But while he seemed all too eager to talk to me, he didn't seem very concerned with the topic. Instead, he started asking about me, first asking my opinion on the subject, which I defected saying that I was interested in his thoughts about it. But afterwards, he started asking things that weren't even related to the hospitals. He started asking me about my job as a reporter and how it affected my personal life since I was quote-unquote famous. I assured him that I wasn't famous, but then he continued asking me personal questions, including about my love life. I informed him that those were none of his business, but he didn't seem to take the hint. He kept trying to talk to me until I flat out told him to leave. It took him a while to do so, but eventually he got the message. He looked a bit offended, but then said, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You're probably busy with work. Before walking off, I felt a bit weirded out by it, so we took a break from recording and had lunch before going back to work. The rest of the workday was more or less the same as before the weird guy. It wasn't until we were packing up for the day that I saw the man again. He simply walked back up to us again and started talking to me. I tried to tell him that we were finished filming and there wasn't anything else to talk about. But he didn't take no for an answer. He then asked me for my phone number. And that's when the pieces started to click into place. He was being so weird because he was trying to make a pass at me. I kindly told him no and that I wasn't interested. And fortunately, he wasn't so keen on my answer. He then asked me if I was single or not and then said that whatever man I had was probably an asshole and that he could treat me so much better. He started raising his voice at me and calling me a bitch for playing with his feelings. That's when my cameraman David stepped in. He wasn't in the best of shape, but he was a big guy, so having him step up and say something was such a huge relief to me. He walked up and got between me and the crazy dude before saying, Buddy, she ain't interested, so take a hint. The man seemed a bit intimidated by the large man in front of him before glancing back at me again. He called me a bitch before walking off, giving us the middle finger. I let out a huge sigh of relief as I was reaching my breaking point before David turned to me and asked me if I was okay. I gave him a little nod and thanked him for saving me and I get into the van and try to calm down as we drive back to the station. I never saw the creep with a red cap and denim jacket again, and I hope that I never do. I'm not 100% sure that this story belongs here, and so if it does get removed for not fitting the criteria, I understand completely, but I thought that I would share just in case. I'm going to start out to say that this isn't some flashy scary story and it doesn't have the most satisfying ending, but none got hurt, which I am extremely grateful for. This all happened when I was in like grade 5 or 6. I'm Canadian, so we have primary school, kinder to grade 8, and then we have high school 
which is grade 9 to grade 12 or 13, and then go to college or university. So, I think I would have been around 8 or 9 years old at that time. I'm now as of writing this, 23 years old, going to be 24 in July. So, my memory may be a bit foggy, but what happened this day will forever stand out to me. I, at that time, an 8 to 9 year old female, and my sister who was 2 years younger than me, let's call her Paya, went to a little French immersion school growing up. At the time, we were not living close to it, so we had to take a school bus. The bus stop where we would be picked up in the morning and then dropped in in the afternoon was about a block or so away from the apartment buildings that we lived in. My sister and I would get up at 7 a.m. and catch the bus for 7.30 a.m. to get to school for 8 a.m. There was another family that also caught the bus at our stop with some younger children. So, we were never fully alone. But, my sister and I made the walk there and home without any adult because my mother worked nights and my sister and I thought that we were old enough to walk the short distance alone. This will be important later. This all happened during late spring, think around April or May, when the weather was getting consistently hotter during the day, upwards of 20 degrees Celsius. I should also note that I have allergenic asthma, which means activities like running or strenuous exercise, as well as allergens like pollen, can all and will trigger my asthma. And for this reason, I wasn't a big runner, and seeing me run was a rare occurrence. So, in the morning, bright and early, at 7.15, my sister and I head out to go wait at the bus stop for the school bus. Everything was pretty normal. Me, being the more obviously tired one of us. But something stuck out to me. I noticed an old brown pickup truck parked in one of the driveways of a nearby house. A person sat in the driver's seat, seemingly doing nothing, maybe asleep, I don't know. This wouldn't have been weird, except I knew that the people there drove a minivan. Maybe it was just how ugly the color of the brown pickup was, but it really stuck out to me. In hindsight, I should have questioned why the guy in the truck just sat there in his vehicle for over 15 minutes doing nothing, but I was too tired to care. So off to school we went, and the day was honestly forgettable in how routine it was. On the bus to go home, however, my sister and I got into an argument, so when we got to our stop, Paya took off running back to the house ahead of me, leaving me with the parents who picked up their younger children at the stop, and after they left, I was just alone. I was not impressed by the stunt that my sister had pulled, but I just began my walk down the street with traffic near me going the same way I was walking. I was about a minute into my walk home when I noticed that brown pickup truck that looked oddly familiar. I hadn't realized that it was probably the one from that morning. It was slowing down beside me as I walked. And now, it was a pretty hot day out. One kid had collapsed during recess because of heat stroke, so I was having a hard time already due to the heat. The driver of this old brown pickup rolls down the passenger window just to talk to me. He was waving a hand at me to get me to stop. I do stop because I was raised to be polite, but I kept my distance. There was a patch of grass separating the curb and the sidewalk, meaning that I had at least 60 centimeters of space between me and the curb. Hey there, kiddo. Where are you headed? The driver, a man in his late 50s or so, asked. Now, I had been raised knowing all about stranger danger, so I was already on guard about this. Home? I told him, purposefully vague about it. At this point, the man leaned over and locked his passenger door. 
I was able to see him a little better now. He had a tattoo of what I think was a tiger and some other animals up his right arm. He wore a plain gray muscle shirt, and I couldn't see what kind of pants he was wearing because I was short. His hair was a salt and pepper of gray and black, pulled into a low greasy ponytail, and he had a mustache. Not to profile, but like one of those stereotypical pedo stashes. His skin tone was tan, but he seemed to be Caucasian, and his hands were large with a scar across his knuckles. Well, how about you hop in, and I'll give you a ride. You know, it's pretty hot out today. This complete stranger offered me with a smile, and I noticed he seemed to have a missing tooth too. I, of course, smiled back not to be rude, and I simply said a polite, Oh, no thank you, sir. And I started walking again. Now, this would have been fine and dandy if it had just ended at that. But instead, he began keeping pace with me in his truck and insisting that I get in. That it was too hot out and that all the other kids had been picked up. Now, this struck me as odd and still does even now because this meant that he had been watching me when all of us had gotten off the bus. Though I guess he didn't notice my sister run off but still, this was really creepy. I again said, No, thank you. But he didn't seem to take the hint. In fact, he became more pushy and maybe a little irritated. He had pulled up so close to the curb, he was almost jumping it with his pickup now. And at this point, I was really feeling scared that this man might do something that I wouldn't like. So I quickly said, um, have a nice day. And then I took off running as fast as I could towards my apartment complex. I vaguely heard him shout something at me, but I just kept running, cutting over the grassy hill with a few trees on it instead of staying on the sidewalk. I saw that someone had just left the underground parking area that connected two of the buildings, and I ran in just before the big door that let cars out closed. I didn't stop running until I made it up to the 8th floor, got into my house, and then slammed and locked the door. At this point, I was in a full-blown asthma attack as well as crying in fear. I collapsed against the door hyperventilating and sobbing. And my sister was now freaking out at how I just burst in like that. But I couldn't get out what I was trying to say as I could barely breathe. Eventually, I was able to calm down and my mother came home from what she has been doing. I was then able to explain what had happened. My mother then called the police, and we had a female officer come interview me, to whom I recounted only what had happened on my way home from the bus stop, and then the nice policewoman took my statement. Unfortunately, nothing ever came of the investigation, and it didn't help that I couldn't remember the license plate other than it looked like it wasn't from Ontario, Canada. So, I never really heard anything after that. But, to the man who may or may not have tried to kidnap me on my way home from school, let's not meet ever. I, a 29-year-old female, used to do some street performing when I was low on money, and at that time of the story, I was 25. I had recently lost a lot of weight and needed to save money for skin removal surgery, in addition to buying all the new clothing and seeing a chiropractor because of the changes in my gait affecting my spine. So, this was a Friday night, and I was in a college town near the state university with a lot of bars and restaurants. Because all of my clothings hung off my body like a tablecloth, I was wearing a decorative scarf tied into a dress, and it was a little on the revealing side, but it didn't look as sloppy as the rest of my clothing. If you don't wear decent clothing and makeup and such when you street perform, 
People assume you're homeless and can be really shitty towards you. This will be relevant to the story. So I was up tuning my guitar, sitting in a camping chair outside of a couple of bars, and at around 8.30 p.m., this beige SUV pulls up and parks in front of me. The guy driving it hopped out and approached me. He said, Hey, do you want something to eat? I answer, Nah, I'm okay, but thanks though. And he just said okay, and then he got back into his car. But instead of driving away, he just sat there staring at me. I thought it was a little bit strange at that time, but I was focused on getting warmed up, so I didn't initially worry about it too much. I was only planning on staying out until about midnight, so I wanted to maximize my time. It was the end of the dinner time, beginning of the bar time rush, so it took me a while to realize that the beige SUV was still there and the guy was still sitting in the driver's seat looking at me. I'm pretty sure he didn't even pay the parking meter. At about 9.30 p.m., he hops out again, and then he comes to me. He says, Hey, are you hungry yet? I answer, No, I'm okay. I ate before I came out here. He then answers, Come on, I want to give you something, but I don't have any cash. Let me buy you dinner. This does happen, though, when someone who doesn't carry cash sees a street musician that they like, they will often offer to buy a snack and then bring it to you, so I didn't find that strange. I then tell him, Okay, sure, if you want to bring me a snack, that's cool. He then said, Okay, come with me. I tell him, Uh, no, I'm not leaving my spot here. He then says, There's a really good restaurant I want to take you to, but it's too far to walk. We need to drive there. I then answer him, I'm sorry. I'm really not interested in going somewhere. I need to stay here and make some money tonight. And then he tells me, I thought you were hungry. Come on, let me buy you dinner. I was starting to get frustrated, so I told him, no, I told you I'm not actually that hungry. If you want to tip me with something other than cash, a slice of pizza from the place across the street, or a soda or a cigarette, that I'm fine with, but I'm not leaving my spot. He then says, No, I'm not going to buy you a slice of pizza. If you want dinner, you need to come with me. At this point, tons of people were walking past us, and I was getting really annoyed at him for keeping me from playing music. I tell him, Well, I'm not going anywhere, and I need to make some money tonight, so I'm done talking about this. At that point, I start playing my guitar to show him that I was done with this conversation. I probably should have been more concerned by this point, but I was honestly just pissed off. It wasn't uncommon for men who saw me street performing to offer me food or shelter in exchange for sex, so I kind of assumed that's what he was after at that point. For about the next hour, I focused on just playing music and chatting with people, and it was actually a pretty productive night. I had almost forgotten about the creepy dude, until he got out of his car and leaned against the door still staring at me. At this point, it was almost 11 p.m., and it dawned on me that he had been there for over two hours. And that's when the alarm bells finally started to go off in my head. I had a hard time focusing on the music after that because he was just standing there staring at me. And the longer it lasted, the more I felt like he had something more nefarious than just trying to bribe a young homeless woman to sleep with him in mind. At about 11.30, I realized that I needed to do something sooner rather than later. It was pretty much peak bar hour, but the streets were going to become less crowded eventually, and I was going to be walking home. I did not want to risk him following me. Now, 
When I'm street performing, I'm in a really friendly mode. I'm not the most intimidating looking girl in general, so I don't think he was expecting me to confront him directly. But when I feel threatened, I tend to get pretty mad pretty fast, and figuring that I had plenty of witnesses, I walked right up to him, angry as hell by this point. I ask him, Why are you staring at me? Him, taking aback, said, Huh? You've been staring at me for three hours now. Do you just like making younger women uncomfortable? I was mad, talking progressively faster and louder, and it was very clear that this wasn't going the way he expected it to. He then said, No, 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 I wanted to buy you dinner. So you're just waiting for me to get hungry enough to go get dinner with you? When I've already said no several times. That's not being helpful, it's being creepy. I know there aren't any restaurants that are still open at 11.30pm around here. No, no, this one is. It's still open, he said. I don't care if it's still open because I don't want to go anywhere with you. I told you that. So why are you here still waiting? No, you don't understand. He looked like he was racking his brain for an excuse. What? What am I not understanding about you staring at me for the last three hours? No, you see, I'm, I'm an Uber driver, he answered. Of all the stupid excuses he could have picked, this was possibly the stupidest. Me, pretending to quote-unquote understand, I said, Oh, okay, I get it. You've been waiting all this time for someone who ordered an Uber. Him smiling said, Yes, yes. And you were just going to leave them waiting while you took me to a restaurant then? What happened next freaked me out more than anything else that night. As soon as I blew a hole through his piss-poor cover story, it was like he took off a mask. His smile disappeared, and his voice was deadly serious as he climbed back into his car and then said to me, Okay, you will never see my face again. And then he drove off, fast. I just stood there, shook. I'd had plenty of creepy encounters while street performing, but not like this. It was impossible to convince myself that he was going to do anything besides abduct me. I was done after that. I decided to order an actual Uber home instead of walking, which cost about half of what I'd made in tips that night. In the back of that Uber counting my cash, I realized that it was time to retire. The small amount of money I made during the daytime was not worth the effort, and the decent money I made at night was not worth the risk. I've since moved on to a new side hustle, and I also developed agoraphobia, which was really diagnosed because of this and other incidents like it. I hate leaving the house alone. I order most of my groceries and household supplies through DoorDash and I have a job that's only three blocks away from my apartment. Still, on my walks to and from work, I find myself constantly checking my surroundings, using the reflection in the storefront windows to make sure that I'm not being followed. So, creepy guy in the beige SUV, I hope you keep your promise and that I never see your face again. This was in middle school. My teacher was absent one day, and this gym coach was substituting for him that day. I have seen him around the school before, and he has substituted for us a few times before. I was sitting on my desk, talking to my friend behind me, and pretending to do my work. And for some reason, he decided to walk around the room to check if we were doing the assignment. So... I turned to my desk and I started writing. He goes one by one by everyone's desk, 
but then slows down once he reaches mine. He hovers over me, just staring down at my work, and I got nervous because I didn't want him calling me out. But for some reason, I felt his breath on me. It was heavy, which was really grossing me out. He was a frail, old-looking man, so I didn't think much of it. He walked really slowly and seemed harmless but was very passive-aggressive when he spoke to all of us. I'd always get this weird, creepy vibe from him, but always thought that it was just me. A few months go by, and the rumor of him being fired circled around the school. I was curious, so I'd ask around to know what the tea was. Apparently, the same teacher that would sub for my class was fired. He was caught trying to touch the girls during practice and throughout the gym periods. He touched the girl, which was soon reported by the student. And he even got caught hiding in the crack of the door, watching the girls change in the locker room. He finally got caught while doing so, and he was soon fired and kicked out of the school. The news made it everywhere, even on the news, and it spread like wildfire. Thinking back on it now, it gives me chills to think that he would watch girls change. And thank goodness he got caught. You never know people's intentions. I'm a 22-year-old female, and back when I was in college, I used to party a lot. I used to go out with the girls to drink or hang out at large get-togethers where I didn't even know the name of the person whose house I was at. Looking back at it, it's not my proudest time, but at least I can say that I lived it up in my early 20s. The night was just like most weekends, at a bar getting wasted with the girls, and we had just finished our midterm exams and we were celebrating the fact that we survived it. We spent the first bit of the night comforting one of my friends, Mary, who didn't think that she did great on the test. But after a while, we managed to get her to open up and we were enjoying our night. At around 1.30 in the morning, we decided to all go home because we were past the point of feeling good drinking and closer to passing out. So we all called rides to get us home. Me and my friend Priya lived nearby, so we decided to only call one cab and I would just get dropped off at my house before the cab drove to the dorms. I lived a few blocks away from campus, so it made sense to carpool since we were both going the same way. Our cab came relatively quickly, and after saying our goodbyes, me and Priya went into the cab. Our driver was a guy who looked to be in his early 40s, with very short brown hair and wearing a plaid shirt. But when the door opened up, he looked back at us and said, Well, hello ladies, where can I take you? Priya told him to go to the university while I managed to slur out the words to tell him to drop me off a few blocks before that. Alrighty then, he said, his smile never leaving his face. He put the car in drive and then pulled out, but didn't put the meter on. At first, I thought he forgot, which in my drunk mind meant that the ride was free. But after a while of driving in the direction of the university, he took a turn into a residential area. Um, uh, excuse me, I said, needing to take some stops in between words to avoid throwing up. The, the university is, is that way. I point back to the road we were at before. You girls are university students, right? The driver said. You'd probably get in trouble stumbling around campus after drinking so much. So, I'm taking you somewhere to sleep it off. We would? Priya said, looking surprised. But I do it all the time, she drunkenly admitted the alcohol clearly confusing her. I, on the other hand, was fully aware of the situation now. 
she can just go to my place, I piped up quickly. It's just before the university. You can stop there and you can let us out there. As I said this, my heart beat faster in my chest. This guy's intentions were clear and it wasn't to get us to our destination like any normal cab driver. I stared at the man in quiet horror when he shook his head, that same six miles still on his face, and said, I've got a better place where you two ladies can stay at, he said, as he continued driving every second farther away from our route home. No, thank you, I said. My dad will be expecting us back soon and he'll be really upset otherwise. As I say that, I reach into my back pocket, my eyes locked on him. We matched gazes through the rearview mirror, and I froze, just staring at him, hoping that he would let us go. I'm sure he wouldn't mind, the man said, and just as he did, he glanced at me before looking back to the road. In that split second, his eyes were off of me, and I took my chance. Hey, Siri, call my dad. The driver pulled over instantly and turned around to face us, trying to grab at my phone. Priya, finally understanding the situation, kicked him back as I held it as far away from the man as possible. We both screamed as the tussle continued for a few moments, until the call connected and we all went silent as we did. Hello? It was my dad's voice. I was sobbing while I held onto the phone. I threw open the car door and then Priya and I started to run. My father was still on the line asking what was going on while we sobbed. And looking back, the man didn't come out of his vehicle. Instead, the door closed before the lights came back on and the car drove away quickly. I started to explain what had happened to my father as I cried, and me and Priya hugging each other for support. Our throats ache from the bawling. After a few minutes, my father showed up in his pickup truck, alongside two police cars. I hardly acknowledged the cops as I ran into my father's arms and into safety. His arms closed around me as I started to cry all over again. He reassured me that I was safe now, and then the officers walked forward and introduced themselves. They took us to the station, and then we filed a report. They assured me that the man wouldn't be too hard to find, and they did end up catching him. While he did spend some time in jail, it was only for nine months. I'm sure he's somewhere out there now, maybe even doing the same thing that he tried to do to me and Priya that I will remember his face for as long as I live, and I hope that I never see it again. I'm a 25-year-old female from England. This started about five months ago, and first, it was quite a pleasant interaction, but it slowly got worse and more creepy. It started about October to November. I noticed that my wing mirror on my car had been put inwards. I park a street away from my house, so I have a short walk to it. And my house is also on the main road with one driveway and my parents park on the drive. I asked my mother if this was her doing as it was a thoughtful thing to do. She refused and my father also said that it wasn't him. So, I thought that it was just a kind or thoughtful person that did it. After all, where I park has a lot of older people, and they always say good morning to me when I set off to work. This continues for the months onwards. I asked a couple older people on the street, and they said that it wasn't them either. So, I just continued going to work and didn't notice anything else until the winter weather got worse. December 2023 was when the weirdness continued. The frost kicked in and the snow started on occasions. Since I set off from work at 7 a.m., it can be frosty at that time and I would need to de-ice my car. About mid-December, I remember running late for work 
and it was around 7.15 a.m. and I still had not de-iced my car. So, I was doing a careful rush to my car as it was very cold and icy. Only to get there and see that it had been de-iced for me. I was confused and a little happy, but also shaken. It was a really strange feeling. Again, I asked my parents and anyone that I saw on the side street. It wasn't any of them. My mom laughed and said, Oh, you might have a secret admirer. Well, it's like she was a fortune teller. The de-icing of my car happened a few more times on very icy days. From January onwards is when it got strange to the point that I started parking elsewhere. About the end of January, the start of February 2024, I saw what I can only describe as homemade food left on top of my car. Don't worry, I didn't eat anything. I ended up throwing these away once I got to work. But I found this situation was getting beyond strange. Around the same time, the first letter slash note was left. It was written in what I would describe as a doctor's handwriting. It was basically asking if I enjoyed being treated like, and I quote, the princess that I deserve to be treated like. I brought this home and I showed my parents and they didn't like this at all. My dad said he was going to start parking on the street so I can park on the drive for a while. I said that that would be a good idea. However, if this person was looking for my car, then he would know which house was mine. My dad agreed, but also pointed out that he or she may have already been watching me and may actually already know where I live. He stated that the main thing was me walking home from my car to the house at 8.15 p.m. He stated that he would sort the situation out if anything happened. I questioned possibly going to the police, and he stated that they would just laugh at us without any proof. He was right, we didn't have anything, and I didn't like the idea of parking back on the street, so I didn't. Now it's April, and I stopped parking on the drive a few weeks ago, and now I've started parking on a different street, but still close to my house. Nothing has happened since February, and I hope that it doesn't, as it was starting to get worse. Do I have a stalker? Or is someone just trying to mess with me? I don't know. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer it as much as I can. So one day, I took the bus as usual to get home, and this guy sitting next to me gets off at the same bus stop. I know pretty much all the neighborhood people, and I don't think I ever saw anyone of his nationality. During the way home, I was on the phone speaking another language. So this guy, after we get down from the bus, makes a sound to get my attention and then ask me where I'm from. I should have just walked away, but in this situation, I got scared and I didn't act rationally. So I answered him, then he asked me where I live, and I tell him that I live here without pointing exactly to my house. But then, he proceeds to ask me if he can get some with me. At that point, I started to laugh hysterically and I keep telling him that I have a boyfriend. I know, I should have just threatened him that I would call the police or something, but I got scared and I didn't want him to turn violent for not telling him what he wanted to hear. I tried to leave but then he followed me, so I stopped to confront him, and he wants to give me a hug and say that I'm so beautiful. I kept replying that I can't and I don't want to, to which he then offers to just shake my hands which I nervously agree just to get out of the situation. After that, I then changed paths and hoped that he wouldn't watch me get home, and then I returned back after. Should I learn how to stop acting like a total idiot in these situations? Yes. But should I be concerned? 
if you will begin to stalk me? Christmas Eve dinner at Burger King. Sounds innocent enough, right? Not my first choice, but I had to work late, and it being Christmas Eve, it looked to be my best choice. I got finished working at 9 and I had some coupons for Burger King, so that made my decision for me. When I got there, I noticed that it was still open, but the dining room was shut down. So the only way that I could get something is if I went through the drive through The only problem is, I don't have a car. I try to walk up to the drive through and place my order, but the compassionate young lady working the drive through wasn't having it. She told me that if I didn't have a vehicle, then I could not use the drive through I became rather aggravated and began seeing things that I'm not proud of. At this moment, an older woman wearing a shining armor appeared on the scene and offered me to jump in her car and to order my food. At first, I turned her down, not wanting to be a bother, but after some convincing, I decided to accept her help. After ordering my food, it took so long to get it that I missed my bus and I just got upset. The nice woman offered me a ride home and I felt kind of put off by the offer and I declined. But she was persistent, but at the same time nice, and then convinced me to take her offer. Mind you, I'm a 250-pound, 30-some man, so I really didn't feel that threatened by a 50-some woman. If the circumstances were different, I would not have taken the ride. After I told her where I lived, we proceeded to go home. About five minutes from my house, she made the wrong turn. I explained that I lived the other way and that she needed to turn around or let me out of here and I will just walk the rest of the way. It was when that woman's demeanor changed and she told me that she could not let me spend Christmas Eve alone and that she was taking me to her house. I told her that I needed to get home immediately to let my dog out and that I would be fine. The woman then tried to entice me with cocaine and liquor at her place. But since I'm in recovery, I told her that I wasn't interested. She refused to turn around or to let me out and then started to drive strangely, not stopping at stop signs. I'm not gonna lie, my mind was racing and I began to sweat. I knew that I could physically overpower this woman, but what awaited me at her house? I also felt bad about hurting her after all of the kindness, but I had to get away before her house and I didn't know where that was. So, I did not know how much time I had. Then all of a sudden, the car in front was stopped at a stop sign and across from it another was stopped also. She had to slow down to almost a stop at this point. And this is where I made my break. I jumped out with the car still moving, leaving my food in the car, and I took off running. As I was running away, she stopped and got out of her car and began trying to talk to me into getting back into her car with her. That just wasn't an option. I don't know what her motives were or who she was, but I knew that I wasn't willing to risk my life over it. I ran all the way home and made sure that I wasn't followed. What would have happened to me if it was two years earlier and I was still doing drugs and drinking? Her offer of cocaine and booze would have probably worked on me. A kidnapping, murder, sex trafficking, organ trade, or I don't know. Being a man, the thought of the vulnerability most women face every day was so foreign to me. And now I understand the fear most women face. I really feel this nice woman had a nefarious purpose and that I just so happened to be the perfect victim of the opportunity. Does anybody have any thoughts about this? That would be really appreciated. I never went to the cops because I felt that they may not believe me or they might look down on me for being scared. Should I place a police report? What if by me not reporting this, 
that someone else ends up getting hurt? Or am I just jumping the gun and conclusions? Yesterday, I celebrated my birthday and I invited my ex-girlfriend Emma because we're actually still really close friends. She took the train to get to me, which takes about one hour and a half and requires changing trains twice. She left around midnight and she should have been home around 1.30 to 1.45 a.m. Shortly after 1 a.m., she texted me about a weird dude following her after striking up an upsetting conversation with Emma about whether she was gay. And when she answered truthfully that no, she's just trans, hoping that he would go away if she was friendly enough, he went on about why she was trans even though she knew that it was satanic. He also told her that he'd already noticed her on the train that same morning which just strikes me as especially creepy. She got off at a stop, intending to wait for her subway home. But then, he got off with her, and he wouldn't leave her alone. The next subway to her place wouldn't come for another 25 minutes, and that stop was deserted. She sent me multiple anxious voice messages, until she eventually called me, borderline crying and panicking, saying that she had run away from the station and was now lost with little idea where she was and even less of an idea of how to get home. And her phone was on 8% battery. She didn't have any money to call a cab either. She said she couldn't go back to the station because this guy was presumably still there and he had followed her when she had tried to just take the next train in the direction that she had come from in an attempt to try and get away from him. I advised her to call the police, which she did, and they apparently came, took her statement, and then left again, leaving her there on the outskirts of a big city with still no idea how to get home. I told her to use Google Maps to just try and get home and try to save battery, but to update me periodically. She called me again a few minutes after, saying that she was 45 minutes on foot away from home, but had thankfully managed to reach her mother, and she was coming to pick Emma up from where she was. I stayed on the line with Emma until her mom got there. I am so angry. Emma already struggles with severe anxiety and agoraphobia. The fact that she managed to make it to my birthday party is an achievement for her. And this is not going to help her at all. Why do people like this exist? This story takes place in a very small town in the northeast region of the United States in the summer before I went off to college in 2015. After I graduated high school, my parents decided to move to a smaller, more affordable house, about 45 minutes north into the mountains. We stayed in my childhood home because the public schools in my area were the best in the state, and my parents really valued my education. I ended up going off to an amazing university, and now I have an incredible career because of my excellent education. As most people in the U.S. know, Amazing public education usually means higher property taxes. My parents got to the point where they could not afford the taxes on their 4,000 square feet home anymore and they decided to sell it just after I graduated from high school. Their home is humble and it sits on a beautiful piece of land on the side of a beautiful mountain. The trees are always so green and there is a lot of wildlife around. They don't have many neighbors either, as their driveway is about a mile and a half long. But this is what they chose to live in after I went off to college. In August of 2015, we moved into this house. I wasn't planning on staying long, as I was getting ready to head off to college as a freshman. 
we decided to have a little housewarming party with a bunch of family friends and my best friend at that time as well. My dad was manning the barbecue, my mom was making drinks, we were playing with our dogs. It was a really grand time and everyone had so much fun. My dad had built a brick fire pit in our backyard. And just to set the scene for you here, the fire pit was about 30 feet from our back patio door and we had a picnic table and other seats all around. Behind the sitting was the tree line. It was so dark sometimes at night that you needed a flashlight to see 10 feet in front of you. With a fire pit lit, you couldn't see someone unless they were either sitting next to you or across from you in front of the pit. My best friend decided to stay the night and we asked my dad if we could make s'mores. As it was getting a little chilly as it does in the late summer in the northeast at night, my parents left us outside with my dog, Nino. Nino was a huge 100-pound black lab slash pit bull mix. He was such a loyal and incredible dog that my dad trained as his right hand. He was our protector. As he could run extremely fast, he was very strong and he alerted us when something went bump in the night. Side note, he passed away a week before I got married in 2022. He was 17 years old and lived an adventurous life with my parents, hunting squirrels, laying out in the sun, and running amok. Nino laid in between us facing the tree line and my best friend was to my right. Our backs were to the dark, dense tree line, which was our first mistake. We were laughing, joking, and eating s'mores together, planning for the future, and just generally excited about going off to college together. She decided to play some music, and we just relaxed there, feeling content and at ease. It was the perfect summer night. Until... Nino started growling. I saw his ears perk up and his head cocked to the side. He then sat up and continued to growl. My best friend and I both looked at each other, thinking Nino just saw a stray animal or something that's really non-threatening. This area was known for lots of deer and rarely a coyote or wolf. As he was trained to help my dad hunt deer... We just assumed that it was a buck or fawn in the distance behind us. We went back to singing along to the music playing and talking about our fall 2015 class schedule. Again, Nino started growling. Our second mistake is that we did not call out for my dad. We didn't even think there was a problem until Nino started barking repeatedly. This time louder and more vicious. He stood up and started barking as if alerting us to activity beyond the tree line that we couldn't see. We stood up as well, the fire obscuring our view. My best friend took her phone, paused the music, and then turned on her flashlight. She started to walk towards the edge of the tree line with Nino by her side, still growling and barking, alerting us to not go any further and to call for help. We stood still in silence, listening. I was too afraid to even breathe at this point. She started walking into the woods, and when she shined her flashlight, she saw a figure. Someone peering behind a tree, a man with a green shirt and green pants on, about 5 foot 11 with glasses too. We screamed, and we ran as fast as we could inside, leaving the fire unattended and this creepy man behind the tree. What we did not know at that time is where this man came from. We crashed through our front door, breathless with Nino tailing behind us, and startled my mother who was washing dishes and cleaning up from the party. She was talking to my dad about something that they saw on the news, and I think we cut him off mid-sentence to explain that there was a man dressed in all green lurking behind a tree in the woods. We didn't know how long he was there or if he was still there, but we were both crying. 
I remember feeling extremely sick like I was going to throw up. My dad jumped up, grabbed his shotgun and headlamp, and then ran outside with Nino. My mom gathered us into the living room, shut all of the lights in the house off, and then locked the doors. She told us to be quiet and that she was going to call 911. As she did that, my best friend and I shook in fear. We were anticipating gunshots and screaming, but we never heard any. My mom, now on the phone with 911, described what we saw to the operator. And I heard my mom say, Oh, in an alarming way. It was at this point that my dad came back inside and my mom let him know that the police were on their way to us. Being in a small town on the mountain with less than 10,000 people means that we don't get our own police force. We get the state police every time there is a call made to emergency responders. My dad put his gun away and waited outside for the police to show up. To our bewilderment, they didn't just send one police officer, but ten and an entire SWAT team and a helicopter to circle the area. We were rightfully terrified. I was practically having a panic attack at this point. The police officers came inside our home and asked my best friend and me what the man was wearing, what he looked like, if they were able to discern any scars or tattoos and we explained the weird matching green outfit and the glasses. The officer excused himself and alerted the police and SWAT members outside of our description. They started to search the woods behind our home with their guns drawn, flashlights, and the helicopter circling above. They advised us to stay inside and that they would let us know when or if they found something. And after about 25 minutes, we got another knock on our door. It was not one, but two officers this time. My dad let them in and they began to explain the situation. One officer explained that we must have seen on the news that a convicted felon from the prison, about 20 miles away, escaped into the mountains. The police set up a perimeter 10 miles around the prison, but the convict escaped them yet again. The outfit the man was wearing, as well as our description, signaled to them that the escaped convict was 100% lurking through our remote, densely wooded backyard that night. The all green outfit was a standard issue for prisoners in my state then. They did not, however, find a man near us after 25 minutes of searching, so he was still out there. The officers let us know that they were going to have a squad car stay and watch our house for a few days as they were unable to locate the fugitive and they believe that he is still an active threat to our safety. That night, and for three nights after that, we all slept in the living room together. My dad's shotgun was within arm's reach of him at all times. And later that week, we got another knock on our door from the officers stationed outside of our home. They let us know that the man was back in police custody and that we were all safe now. They advised us to get security cameras and how sorry they were that this happened to us. After that, my parents spent about $10,000 on security cameras and also fencing for our backyard. It is now all fenced in and we have about four cameras to watch the tree line at all times. I guess you never know what will happen or what goes bump in the night. To the escaped convict and perhaps murderer who watched my best friend and I sing along to 2015 pop hits from your hidey hole behind my parents' isolated home, let's never meet again. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate it. I would also like to give some extra love to my Patreon members, my channel members, and also my tippers. Thank you so, so much. 
If you would like to extend a little bit more support for the channel, don't forget to leave a like and a comment down below. If you would like to become a Patreon member, a channel member, a tipper, or even to buy merch, check out the links in the description below. Again, thank you. And I hope you stay scared because your fear feeds me. <laughs>